Hey, what's up everyone? This is another episode of the Caffeinated Contractor, episode number 21. And today's is going to be a little bit different. Typically our shows are mainly geared for those homeowners or maybe just um, business owners looking to do a remodeling project at their home or at their business. And we have guests that come on and we talk about things to help them along with their project. But today is going to be a little different. Today, I'm talking to Alex Pardo, and Alex is a fellow entrepreneur. And today, what we're going to talk about is just the things that we go through as entrepreneurs. And it doesn't really have to be for entrepreneurs. It's just life stuff that we go through. And we talk a lot about what our identity is as far as who do we want to be, who do we want to become, are we happy with where we are in life right now? And if not, what can we do to help us get to the point where we want to be? He talks uh, about this concept called future pacing. So for example, if you're not happy with where you are right now, you can future pace yourself and say, hey, in 12 months from now, if I am in the same position I'm in right now, am I going to be happy? If the answer is no, then now's a good time to make some different choices in your life, to make some changes, um, maybe some pivots in your business or whatever it might be. Um, and it's a great exercise to go through. I've done it myself. I still do it today just to really have that check if hey, am I happy right now? Are things going good? And if not, what is draining my energy right now and what do I need to change in order for me to get that energy back so that a year from now, I am feeling so much better than I am right now. So we talk a lot about that. We do get vulnerable and talk about some things that's going on in our lives and our business. Nothing too personal, but it was very eye-opening. And I think if you're a business owner, uh, if you're thinking about starting a business, this is going to be a great episode for you to listen to because you're going to understand the ups and downs of business. And um, you know, you're going to get excited about your dream when you first start. And that dream is going to get you, it's going to motivate you, it's going to inspire you. But then then you're going to hit your first road bump and you got to decide, is this what I'm going to be keep doing? Is this what I want to do with my life? And you're going to hear Alex and I talk about some things that we went through where we were so focused on our vision and what we wanted to do with our lives that we were able to take that um, little road bump or speed bump and turn it into a lesson learned and a great experience that we can share with other people as they go through their journey. So if you're a business owner, this would be a good for episode for you. If you're a fellow contractor who listens to the show just for some education or some whatever, you, you can learn a little something from Launch Mooners talking. If you're looking to start a business, this is a good episode for you. And if you're not into the business thing, there's certain some good life lessons in here that you can take with you as well. So with that said, oh, and one other thing. So Alex is into real estate investing in a different way, not your traditional single family or multifamily home real estate investing, but in self-storage facility investing. And we talk a little bit about that. In fact, he's got his own coaching program where he helps people get from no assets to getting your first self-storage space. So he's got a coaching program that he talks a little bit about the end. Uh, you'll have your contact information in there where you can contact Alex and his team to see how you can um, learn more about him, learn more about what they do. And maybe there's a way that Alex can help you out with your investing um, interests and desires. So with that said, here we are with episode number 21. All right. Welcome to another episode of The Caffeinated Contractor. This is episode 21. We're going to switch things up a little bit today. Uh, I know we talk a lot about home renovations for people who are doing um, research on their renovations and remodels and whatnot. Today, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship, something that I'm very passionate about. Um, in fact, I, I have a, quite a few meetups throughout the week and I'm talking to other contractors, other business people. We just talk business and I love it. Um, and I have an opportunity to talk to an entrepreneur who's probably about 15 or so years, maybe 20 years ahead of me in his journey. Um, and he's got a lot of lessons learned. So I wanted to bring him on the show today because I think it would be beneficial, not just for me, um, but selfishly, I want him on the show. But for a lot of the people that I've been talking to recently about business, the ups and downs, the peaks and valleys, how do we get through that, the mindset behind it. And I think Alex is a perfect person to speak to those so I want to welcome my friend, Alex Pardo. Alex, thank you so much for being on the show today. Chris, man, I'm, I'm blessed and honored that you would have me on. I uh, love talking entrepreneurship and like we were talking offline, love to just be an open book and just share with your audience the, the wins, the challenges, the lessons learned, everything in between, because it's, uh, it's a journey and it's not always on the up like social <laughs> media sometimes portrays. Uh -huh. uh, so th there's been a lot of ups and downs throughout the last 20 years. Uh, yeah. that I've been at this and uh, yeah, just really looking forward to the conversation. 
Excellent. Yeah, I just want to share a quick typical, not a typical day, but a, a day that's not uncommon in entrepreneurship was my day yesterday. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could speak to this a little bit later, but I, I woke up feeling okay. Good day. You know, my normal routine woke up and uh, just throughout the day, I'm like, oh, why am I doing this? You know, <laughs> like all this stress that's going on. I got this going on. I got this going on. I got this yeah. going on. And like three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And then I get a phone call and that phone call lasted maybe a minute and it completely changed my perspective. And I'm like, this mm. is the best day ever, you know? Yeah, man, and yeah. I'm like, this is a typical entrepreneur day. So before we get into all the nuts and bolts of yeah. um, entrepreneurship, let's, let's get, dig into your background. How did you get into entrepreneurship? How old were you And kind of a, a high level story of, of Alex? Yeah. And I'll, I'll do my best to keep, keep it brief and short so we can kind of get to the meat of, of the podcast episode. But mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I, I grew up playing sports. You know, my mm -hmm. dad was a big baseball fan. And so ever since I was four years old, I grew up with a bat in my hand. And, um, and I remember after games, there was like a little baseball card vendor that would set up shop right outside the field. And I really got into trading cards. And I remember at that age, buying packs of cards, ripping them to see what I would have. And then I would trade. And then in some cases I would sell for a dollar more than I was buying the pack for. And I really liked the concept of buying something a little low and then selling it higher. Right. I didn't yeah. realize that was like a version of wholesaling essentially. Okay, and then fast forward. There. Yeah, yeah, no, I felt like I'm like, man, I like this, this, this concept <laughs> of buying something for a buck and selling it for two bucks. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think that was my first kind of exposure to making money or a little mini business, if you want to call it that, right? Obviously it wasn't a business. And then I got to college and I ended up going to job fairs and interviewing with big companies like Johnson and Johnson. Long story short, Chris, I ended up accepting a job with General Electric in their financial management program. And there was something about, I think it was more ego driven. There was something for me in my head that was like prestigious about the thought of climbing the corporate ladder, ladder, so to speak, and one day being a CFO or a CEO of a really big fortune, you know, 100 company. Right. And then uh, it, it's so funny how in our brains, we map out a certain plan and then you like step into it and you experience the reality. Mm -hmm. And I remember three months into that job, I'm like, there's no way I can do this for the rest <laughs> of my life. And I'm not good at a lot of things, but one of the things I think I'm pretty good at is getting clarity about what it is that I want in my life. And then not necessarily knowing exactly how I'm going to get there, but reverse engineering my path to get there. And one lesson for people that I wish I would have learned early on in my journey is that you don't have to wait for the stars to align and for you to have all the answers to your questions before doing something. Mm -hmm. I think my, I'm kind of wired to be a ready fire then aim type of guy. And that has served me well in life and business because while I may not know steps four, five, and six by taking steps one, two, and three, the next step is going to reveal itself or I'm going to fail the lesson and then realize, okay, well, this is not how I do it. Let me try this approach. Yep. And that has really served me. And so I remember looking at my boss all the way up the ladder to where I thought I wanted to be. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure what I want to do with my life, but I know it's not that. Mm -hmm. And so I finished that two year program. I decided to go backpacking around Europe uh, to try to figure out what was next in my life. I had the opportunity to do that. So we, I think we visited 53 cities in 21, 22 countries in nice. three and a half months. Nice. And it was on the train rides in between cities and countries in Europe where I started to really immerse myself in self-development. You know, I read a lot of the classic books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Think and Grow Rich. And I made a commitment. I'll never forget it. I believe I was in Switzerland and I was on the train and I made a commitment that as soon as I get back from this backpacking trip, I'm going to get into real estate. Right. I, I, cause I was reading a lot of books and all these people, the common thread was real estate. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I said, you know, I'm going to, I want to go into business for myself. And I remember being at an internet cafe in Ibiza and a friend of mine sent me an email inviting me to a marketing for deals boot camp that was happening October of 2005. And it was 997 bucks. Now keep in mind for perspective, I had financed the entire backpacking, backpacking trip on a credit card. I was like a little bit over yeah. seven grand in debt. And I was moving back in with my parents, Chris, at 25 years old, wow. like not, not a good look. That's not how I drew it up in my head. And so I had a lot of motivation to yep. figure things out and to kind of get on my feet. 
so I'm winding down the, the intro part of it here. I ended up going to that boot camp. I came back home and I literally ripped out from the three ring binder, a pre foreclosure letter. I went to Kinko's and I made photocopies. I made like 350 photocopies where wow. you still see like the, the black holes on the paper. Yep. Yep. And um, I sent out a pre foreclosure campaign fast forward a little bit over two months or so. Um, I ended up closing my first deal um, oh. between myself and a partner. We made 44,000 bucks on that deal. And I've pretty much been unemployed ever since then. Nice. That's cool. It's interesting your story. Like I've got a, a similar story, similar path where, you know, you just, you're in a position where you're like, you know, initially when I jumped into the military, I knew that like, oh, I want to do this. I'm going to do this. All these milestones, right. That everyone does in the military. But then I got into it. I'm like, oh, man, I'm not sure I really want that, you know? Yeah. And there's always yeah. that like, yeah, there's a, other things in your life you could be doing. Right. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's interesting that we all have that, um, you know, a similar, uh, you know, transition period, I guess, you know, they're all different, but it's all self-reflection, self-development. Yeah. Typically it's the same books that we've read, you know, it's right. always a rich dad, poor dad that always comes I up, know. but I that know. is a very pivotal book. I mean, everyone needs to read that really to yeah. kind of understand the mindset and what really triggers the change in us. Right. Or right. not really change, but it brings the stuff out of us of like, Hey, this is what I really want. Right. And it kind of gives yeah. you that, that motivation and that inspiration to go after it. Yeah, so you, when you, I know I've, I've done it too, where I've left a world of safety to jump into this entrepreneur life. And it was, for me, it was really scary. Uh, at, at my time, I had a wife and two kids, a mm -hmm. mortgage and stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot of factors there. It's easier. I think if you're, if you're younger, maybe I'm wrong. I never sure. tried, but I know the fear behind it, the challenges behind it, the mindset behind it, and then just the courage to just like push through that fear. What was it like for you? going from this prestigious job and I'm sure there was some outside influencers in your, in your life. They were like, Oh, wow, Alex, that's a great job. Why would you do this? Like, yeah. how did you fight yeah. through that? Such a great question. And as I reflect, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to put myself in those shoes. Cause I remember a conversation I had with my parents and I'm very lucky and fortunate, Chris, I, I didn't grow up, you know, in a wealthy family. I also didn't grow up like not knowing when my next meal was going to become middle-class family. My, my parents have done the best. I mean, just incredible parents, very supportive. And I remember sure. when at, I think I was 21 years old when I got the offer from General Electric to be making 50,000 bucks a year. And I remember when I told my parents, Hey, I'm going to leave this, uh, in order to start my own business. They said, are you sure you want to do that? Like you're going to leave the, the safety basically is the word they used of this salary and this great company, General Electric. And I said, yeah, this doesn't make me happy. This is not what I want to be spending my, my time on. And so for me, I think Tony Robbins, Chris talks about like until, until the pain of your current situation outweighs the comfort, um, you know, people are drawn by pain or motivated by pleasure until that pain exceeds the pleasure of staying in that comfortable place you're in, then change won't happen. And I just, yes, I was fortunate. I think in one regard, you know, you bring up an interesting point. I think in one regard, I was very fortunate that I was a single guy at that time. I didn't have kids. I didn't have a family. I didn't have the responsibility I obviously have today. Sure. And so I was fortunate that I was able to go out and take that risk in some people's minds. However, Knowing myself, I don't think it would have been any different had I had a, a wife and kids. In fact, I feel like I, my motivation level would have been like that much higher because I have other people now relying on me. Exactly. And I think one of the greatest tragedy is what I'll call it is when I read, you know, you know, not, not Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs. When I read his, his book, you know, I think he said something in there where he said, I, I basically wrote this book because I wanted my kids to know who I was mm. like despite the level of success that man achieved and what he's known for and just what an innovator creator, like what a brilliant entrepreneur. What I took from that was like, man, that is sad. Like I don't want to have to write a book or record a podcast for my children to know who I was. Right. And I said, regret living with regret is one of those things that's terrible. And so we only get one crack at life. Like do what makes you happy. Like do what's aligned with your core values, integrity, with your faith Mm -hmm. with like, what mark are you leaving on this world? And so it really wasn't that difficult for me to go and take that leap. And I don't think it was because I was single and didn't have other people relying on me. I think it was because the pain of staying in a place that didn't fulfill me. And I just felt like I just wasn't like, I felt like I was built for so much more. And I wanted to, 
have a particular life and I wanted to genuinely impact people uh, and serve people. And I didn't feel like I could really do that at the, at the level. I, last thing I'll mention on this is, you know, faith is very important to me. And I think mm -hmm. my belief is that God has given us all unique gifts and talents. And right. like the parable in the Bible, it's our job to multiply those talents. Right. And if you're stuck in a job or if you're stuck doing something where you don't feel like your talents are being utilized and you feel like you've been created for more, I think it's your duty and obligation as dramatic as that may sound to some people to go multiply that talent. Because as, as it says in the parable, like God's not going to give you more if you don't use what he's already given you. And so I don't know. I think the older I've gotten, the more mature I've become that that really resonates with me. I don't know that I necessarily thought that way in the past. Mm -hmm. But I just knew that the current situation was, was painful and I needed to do something else. Yeah. And I think, you know, for just kind of talking for myself, I think that that pain that I experienced as well, probably the same for you is, is that you had that vision from an early age and that vision really hasn't changed. You know, maybe the, the details of the vision has become more clear as we matured. But I think because I had that vision early on in my life, yet I was going down a different path that I felt like maybe other people wanted me to do. And I had this identity of the military guy and then, then the police officer, right? And that yeah. was who I was. Like, hey, Chris is a tough guy because he's, he's a cop and he carries a gun around and stuff and he goes to Afghanistan. But deep inside, it was painful because my vision was something else. And, and, and I think it was for me that vision and that pain that really just kind of like propelled me to like, all right, that's it. I'm done. I'm out of here because it, you know, for me, and I'm not going to get into my story here, but for me, it, it physically, like God shook me, you know, he gave yeah. me a vision and he's like, Hey, I give you a vision for a reason. It's not yeah. for you to just daydream and be frustrated. It's because that's the path I want you to go. That's the direction you should be going. And he physically okay. shook me with panic attacks that I've never had before. Wow. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And then from that point on, I'm like, I, I'm done. I'm just doing what, what's in me and I'm pursuing it hardest thing I've ever done, but I'm also happy doing what I'm doing now more so than I was in the past. So, um, anyway, there, there's we share so the same much, faith. Yeah, man. There's, well, first of all, a couple things that that's awesome that we share the same faith. Thank you for your service. Yeah, my pleasure. It's men and women like you that just allow us to, to live the life we can live. And, and man, just I have so much respect and admiration for armed, serve, armed forces and just the people serving our country. So thank you. I really mean that. And there's so much nugget and wisdom, so many nuggets and wisdom to extract from your story, Chris. And the fact that like, you're so right, like God has given us a vision. The question is, are you stepping into that despite mm -hmm. how uncomfortable that might be? Or are you going to stay in mediocrity? Right. And, and if yeah. you're choosing like i i understand it's tough man because i get the responsibility people have to provide and put food on the table and be there for their family and we all get 24 hours in a day so i think it's a matter of priority management i think it's a matter of like just manufacturing time and there's going to be a season of hustle right but i think it oh, needs yeah. to be a season not necessarily a lifestyle yep totally agree with that totally agree with that all right. So you made that transition. You decided to go for real estate, specifically wholesaling. Was there a reason why you went with wholesaling rather than, you know, jumping into buy and hold? What was the, the reasoning behind that? Yeah. I'm glad you asked that question because the irony is I got into real estate and all the books I was reading, it was about building wealth and it was about mm -hmm. cash flow, right? It was about like holding properties. Like a, a mentor of mine told me years ago, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. So I, the reason I say it's ironic is because when I got a taste of wholesaling, it almost became like a fix. Like, okay, like I like the thought of making 10, 15, 20, 30 grand, 40 grand on a deal. And, but that's not why I got into real estate. I wanted cash flow and time freedom. And that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that I think I made. Uh, and I use mistakes in, in air quotes, right? Like sure. it, it was, it's a lesson learned. Like exactly. I wish I would have been buying and holding on to more assets because I was playing the wrong game from a tax perspective. Yes, I was making a lot of money every year, but I was being taxed here. You know, fast forward, I must have done between 2005 and 2017. I, I probably did, I don't know, four or 500 transactions, maybe nice. more. And I got, dude, I got burnt out. I got yeah. tired of having to chase the next deal. Mm -hmm. And I remember being on a cruise with my wife. And at that point I had a team of, I think seven or eight people. And uh, while I wasn't wearing the hat of speaking to sellers and doing all the, the, the technician type work, I was leading a team. I was still putting out fires and I'm like, something doesn't align very similar to when I was in GE. I'm like, I don't know that this is the path for me going forward 
where I'm just building and running a wholesaling operation that I didn't think I was building in a way that was sellable. Right. And I told my wife, I said, something needs to shift. And around that time is when I started having thoughts of like, okay, what's next. I knew that I had a heart and a desire to impact people. The reason I started my podcast, the flip empire show back in 2016, which I still do today is because I, I want to share information and knowledge that I've, that I've accumulated and acquired and experienced right. throughout the years. And I knew I needed to, I wanted to lean more into that side of the business, but I, I like real estate. I'm not passionate about real estate, but I wanted to get involved in an asset class that, that gave me more time freedom that allowed me to mm -hmm. build wealth. And I happened to be coaching somebody at the time that owned the storage facility. And like, I just got an inside look into that asset class. I'm like, and this thing has been right under my nose all these years and I never really looked at it. Yeah. So um, that's when I started to kind of plan my exit. In okay. 2019, I decided I'm going to shut down the wholesaling operation, even though it was profitable. And then when COVID came, it was like, you know, life is about perspective, Chris. Things can happen to you or for you. And it's, right. it's, it's how you look at it. When yeah. COVID came, man, while it was a kind of a weird and crazy time, when I think back yeah. on that period of mask and everything else, uh, it was such a blessing because it gave me a reason to accelerate the process of unwinding this, this beast, this operation okay. that was chewing up 40 to 45 grand a month in overhead. And yeah. so by May of 2020, I completely unwound the business and, and yeah, I'll kind of pause there in case you have any follow-ups. Yeah. So going back to when you started feeling the burnout, right? Mm -hmm. With, First of all, what are the signs of that burnout and how long did you live in that season before you actually pulled the trigger on a decision? Yeah, such a good question, man. Uh, you and I are, are well connected with, with our friend Trevor Mock yeah. from, from Carrot, right? And yep. Trevor's such a, such a great, sharp, wise yes. entrepreneur. And, and he talks mm -hmm. a lot about the energy audit, yep. right? Is being in tune, being aware with the things that give you energy and also being clear and understanding what are the things that drain you from energy. And I didn't necessarily know what an energy audit was in 2017, but I was crystal clear on the things that were draining me from energy. And unfortunately it had created and built this business that was draining me from energy. In fact, I, I use the analogy sometimes it felt, imagine constructing, right? Imagine building a prison and yep. then you build it from the inside out. And yet like you lock yourself in and you don't have a key. Like that's yeah. literally what my business felt like. And I'm like, mm. dude, I, I created this business. Like how could I have created something that I don't want to necessarily be in? Right. And so I just started to really ask myself future, future pacing type questions. Like sure. if I'm doing this business 12 months from now, two years from now, how would that make me feel? And I instantly felt in my belly and my core, like ah, mm. thumbs off. Like I don't necessarily... So if you're not happy with the, with what you're doing right now or your current situation, whether it be financially, relationally, spiritually, health, whatever, you can apply this framework to any aspect of your life. Ask yourself better questions and your brain, your conscious and even sub subconscious will come up with the right answers, right? Maybe not immediately, but over time, if you keep kind of like drilling into that uncomfortable space. And then the question becomes is like, again, is that pain going to be greater than the pleasure of just seeking that comfort. And for me, I've just, like I mentioned before, I, life is too short, man. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to live it doing something that doesn't fill me up. And, and I, I want to be crystal clear. It doesn't mean that you always have to be doing something that fills you up. There there's aspects of what I do today that sometimes drain me from energy, but sure. I think it's the awareness of that and not living in that space too long, that's a good point. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. Being aware. I wasn't really aware of the whole energy thing until I started following Trevor and getting yeah. a part of the community. And now it's like with my assistant and we're like, you know, Friday will come around. Oh mm -hmm. man, I just feel like I just got kicked in the teeth this week. All right, what did we do this week that really drained my energy? And we would identify it and like, okay, let's not do so much of that in one week again. Yeah, because I yeah. need to end the week strong because I want to be good for the weekend. You know what I mean? I don't want to be sleeping yeah. all weekend long because I had a rough week. That's right. Um, so that awareness is is really good. The other thing that Trevor talks a lot about is identity. And I know, um, I believe it was an interview that I watched with you and him where you, you're talking about identity and you had your identity wrapped up in, in your wholesaling business. Yeah. And so you, you were doing that up until 2018, I believe. Is that correct? 2020 is when I shut it down. So from end of 2005, yeah, almost 15 years. 
So from, and then 2016, you started your podcast. So I'm assuming that the podcast was kind of geared towards a wholesaling, helping people out with that kind of thing. So your identity was that. Yeah. And you were, and I'm sure that was a struggle with you. Like, Hey, everyone sees me as this person and now I'm changing yeah. things. So how did, how did, how did you navigate through that whole process? I'm so grateful to, to have an opportunity to talk about this. Cause I remember it wasn't that long ago where I felt trapped in this place of like trying to live my life and make a decision about my business based on how others perceived me because mm -hmm. at the time I felt like my identity was what I did. And then through prayer, coaching calls, like just having the right people around me, I realized that what I do doesn't define who I am. Like mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm the son of God. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I, I'm so many. I'm a man. I'm so many other things before I'm an investor or an entrepreneur or whatever, right? Like what I did for a living is just what I did. Those are two separate things. So I had to detach sure. myself from the identity of what I did. And that's when I started to really do a lot of like inner work about not caring as much about how I was being perceived or how people mm -hmm. thought about me. You know, like I'll, I'll be transparent with you, man. Like years ago, I almost didn't start the Flip Empire show because I was in my head about how would I sound? What if I said something that was incorrect? Yeah. What if I like, what if this, what if that, like we all have that inner critic. I can relate and to I, that for sure. Yeah, man. And, and I think it's, it's our job to silence that inner critic and step into like the greatness that you were created to, 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 to live and to be. Yeah. And yeah. so imagine had I not made the decision to start the podcast, like, man, the podcast has been a blessing because I've been able to interview, like, I'm about to have you on the show. Like I, mm. You and I may have never connected. I, ne I just so many relationships, so much yeah. content out there that I feel has helped people and vice versa. They've helped me. And so I just think we need to be hyper aware of the decisions we make. Are we making those decisions because we are concerned about external forces that at the end of the day don't really matter and oftentimes are stories that we create in our head. Like yeah. I was giving myself way too much importance thinking that the industry was going to be a thinking about me when they're not, they're thinking about their own stuff. Uh, yeah. So I, a, I was giving myself way too much importance. B like people don't care about you for the most part, right? Like, yes, my friends and family care about me, but sure. like people are not thinking about like what I'm doing more than 15, 20 seconds. Right. Like, yeah. So I, I just had to detach myself from what I did. And I got to tell you, man, I think episode I want to say episode 426, 427, 428. We're at episode 760 something now. Yeah, that's a lot. But man. I decided to just bear all. Like, hey, uh, here's I've made this decision and here's why I made the decision. And when I tell you, Chris, it was so liberating and freeing to just be like uh, transparent, lay it all. And then yeah. the amount of messages, calls, text messages that I got from other entrepreneurs in our space that you and I would know that yeah. gave them the strength to be like, dude, like I'm feeling the same thing, That's right? Cool, like man. it just, yeah. it was very freeing, man. So I've got two follow-up questions on that one. First is I know when I left, the, when I retired from the military, I left the police department to pursue something completely different. And I knew I was chasing my, the identity that I had of me in, in my mind of being an entrepreneur and creating my own way there was still a long period of, my gosh, am I doing the right thing? Did I make mm -hmm. the wrong decision? Am I just chasing this crazy dream or whatever? Was there a period of like doubt for you? And how long did that doubt, that voice of doubt kind of silence? How long did that take for you if you went through that? I want to give you a thoughtful response. I don't want to just go off the cuff because I'm, I'm trying to think through. Look, I, I think we all experience doubt. I'd be lying to you if yeah. I told you I didn't doubt myself at some point. But mm -hmm. the doubt was never greater than like the sure. doubt never like froze me. Right. Because okay. I've just always, again, I'm somebody who I like to, I like to do my best anyway. Sometimes I fail. I like to do my best yeah. to try to be in the present, but I, I think there's, there's power in future pacing. Like I mentioned earlier sure. on in the show and, and just putting yourself in the future and asking, okay, well, are the decisions I'm making today leading me to where I ultimately want to go, right? right yes or no? Right. Do we need to pivot? Do we need to change course? And so, no, I don't think the doubt ever got, you know, to the point where I was like, man, do I just, am I just not cut out for this, right? Yeah. One of the things I, I tell my, my storage coaching clients is 
the only way you fail, and by the way, this, I think this, this thought process applies no matter what business you're in, sure. right? General contractor, fix and flip, it doesn't matter. I think the only way you fail is if A, you don't believe in yourself and B, you just quit and you just mm. stop like pursuing what it is you're after. Yeah. Okay. You're either going to win or you're going to learn. Like yeah. that, that is my, yeah. I just, I believe that in my core, you either win like or you that. learn. So like either that. way, the perspective is you can't lose. Now yeah. you'd rather avoid really painful learning lessons, but yeah. sometimes in those painful lessons, I mean, that's where the growth happens as cliche as it sounds like mm -hmm. other doors and opportunities open up as a result of the pain you have to go through. I mean, think about when you work out, right? Like yeah. you, what do you do? Like you rip up your muscles essentially. Yep. And then they grow when you sleep and you build them back up. Life and business is, is kind of no different in my mind. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And I have a business coach I've been working with for a few years, Steve Rosenberg, and he keeps saying that business doesn't get easier. You just get better. That's right. You go through all that, all that junk, all those things that you just learned from like, oh, I've been through this before and this is what happened. So, you know, you kind of get better as time goes on, but you don't realize that at the beginning. And sometimes you don't remember that in the moment. Right. It's a little challenging, right. but after, after a decade or so, I'm sure it's, it's a little bit more routine and easier to deal through or go through. Um, my yeah. second follow-up question on that is, uh, so, you know, you had the flipping show, you were wholesaling, and then you moved into self-storage. Was there a transition in followership? Did you lose followers? Did you, I mean, was there an issue with that where you had to like spend a lot of time rebranding and things like that? Yeah, uh, man, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that question. I think it's interesting. I'm, I'm sure I did lose some followers mm -hmm. and that, that was never a concern or a driver for sure. me because yeah. I've always had the mindset that, you know, God's going to put the people that you're meant to attract into mm -hmm. your life and he's going to repel the ones that, that, like, I'm sure there's people that can't stand the, the sound of my voice and hear me on a podcast. That's, that's cool, right? And yeah, then there's yeah. people that listen to every single show I put out and, and they're, they're followers and just like me, there's influencers and thought leaders that I tend to gravitate towards. And there's others that it's like, I don't really care for that guy's message or his vibe. Sure. And I think that's perfectly fine. Like we're not meant to be all things to all people. So I wasn't right. ever too concerned about that. The flip empire show, the name is very misleading because it's no longer about flipping and it's evolved throughout the years. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and we've covered a lot of different things in 760 plus episodes. But you know, I think the the, the greatest advice I got during that period I got a lot of really good counsel, but my coach, who's still my coach today, told me, Alex, don't be anxious to go out and figure out what's next and conquer the next mountain. Fortunately, I had put myself in a place where I had some other income streams and I, I basically was able to take four or five months off. Oh, nice. And he was like, you're going to know when it's, when it's your time to step into something new and shut down the wholesaling operation. May, December is when I committed to storage. Oh, okay. And I said, man, th I'm, this, this asset class feels right for me. I'm going to devote my time and energy to storage. And then the funny thing is, is I, I feel like I went into the business overly confident, borderline mm. cocky, and that's not my nature. And in March, I was leading a mastermind. And one of our members asked me on the break, he goes, hey, man, so you know, you, you committed to storage. I've been listening to your podcast. Like, you have a deal? Like, like, how's it going? And I had to look at him and I'm like, dude, it's not going. And it's because I hadn't put the work in. And wow. I, I think, I think the takeaway for people as obvious as this is going to sound is nothing substitutes doing the actual work. Exactly. Like there is no easy button. There is yeah. no magic bullet. The magic bullet is work. And yeah. yes, as you learn, you can begin to develop processes, systems, leverage sure. people who not how in order right. to do that work more efficiently. Um, one of the questions I always ask myself that, that I'm hoping people take from this episode is whenever I do something, I ask myself four questions. I say, well, can I delegate this? Can I automate it? Can I outsource it? Or can I delete it? Yep. And more times than not, it, it's going to fit into one of those buckets more yeah. times than not. Sure. And then in March, after that, basically getting slapped in the face by my response of like, Hey, I haven't done the work. I recommitted mm. myself and then less than two months later, I was under contract on a 43,000 square foot facility. So. Dang. How many do you have now? I think you I have, have three. Four? Uh, three. Th okay. well, I've been involved in five deals. I've, I've wholesaled a couple and then I okay. currently own and operate three facilities. Nice. So, um, all right. So you went from real estate investing to self-storage. What was the, what was attractive to self-storage to you 
over just traditional real estate investing? Man, that is a loaded question with so many answers. I'll share with you just, just a few. As I started to research the asset class, um, based on all the data that I was finding, it was considered one of the most recession resistant asset nice. classes. Okay. You know, you think about the fact that in America, at least like people are wired to just be consumers. Right. right. And I don't right. know about you, but like, I feel like my wife, like every day I have Amazon packages at my doorstep. You know, people I can't blame buying... my wife. It's me more than my wife, but yes, okay, well, there, there, there you go. So I'm like another package. So people consume things and they need a place. So if the economy is doing well, people are consuming, they need a place to store. If the economy is not doing well, you know, many say we're in a recession right now. Sometimes people downsize, they put their stuff into storage. Right. And I, I love the fact that storage is such an, a sticky asset class. But what yeah. I mean by sticky is that it's a sticky product. Like when somebody moves into a 10 by 20, Think about the pain of disconnect. Think about what it would take for them to move all their stuff out of a 10 by 20. They got to hire a mover, bother friends, get yeah. a truck, like take a whole weekend out of their life. And it's a nuisance expense. Like typically storage is between 50 and 350 bucks a month, depending mm -hmm. on the size and location sure. and all that. And people just tend to pay it. Like, so at our facilities, most of our tenants have been with us for one to two plus years. Oh, wow. And I love the fact, Chris, that storage is a business, like it's an actual business, and yet it has the benefits of real estate, right? Yeah. So depreciation, appreciation, cash flow, the tax advantages that come with, with owning a commercial asset, like cost segregation. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and then here was the kicker for me. I went from having a team of nine and having overhead between 40 and 45 grand to now in three facilities, I don't have any employees. Okay. Right. And I have time freedom with storage, right? Like I, I think I spend an hour and a half, maybe two hours a week, like just looking at the KPIs, looking at the metrics of the business. That's but amazing. I have a, I have a, a third party management company that handles the day-to-day -day operations okay. and storage is a very slow business. Like there's not a lot of fires. There's not a lot of emergencies that happen in storage. Now, let me just address like, okay, what, what's the risk? Because when I started researching storage, you hear about well, how storage is so awesome. But what I didn't know at the time is like, okay, well, what are some of the challenges that come with storage? Well, you still have to follow the right principles, right? Location, location, location. Sure. You, you want to be buying assets in markets where there's growth in population, ideally in the path of progress. Okay. So you still need to follow basic principles, right? Right. But I would say the biggest challenges I've had owning and operating storage, there, there's been two. Um, security issues, right? So like if, and when people break into a unit, you know, just the inconvenience of like, first you have a, a customer who their stuff may have gotten damaged or stolen. Right. They can go through insurance. Like we're not too involved in that process, but it, it's still not fun to deal with. Yeah. And then you have to sometimes do repairs to doors and latches and things that were damaged. Uh, and then the other one that's an inconvenience more than anything is sometimes our automated gate might stop working and then yeah. we have to call a vendor. Right. Outside of that, Chris, I'm not going to lie to you, man. That's it. Like it's, it's, I'm not dealing with tenants and toilet. Yeah. I'm not dealing with evictions. Like I'm not dealing with that typical landlord pain. Mm, yeah. And that was really appealing to me. I was, I went for a long walk. It's me and a friend of mine every Sunday. We go for a two hour walk. We just talk nothing but business. And, um, he, uh, he was a former property manager. I'm a former property manager. And, uh, we were talking last Sunday and he was like, Chris, I'm going to get rid of all my all my rental properties. He goes, I'm paying for roofs. I'm paying for this. He goes, I'm not making my money that I'm expecting, you know? And, you know, my wife and I are having these discussions too. I'm like, I don't know if I want to invest in real estate because we got the property management experience. I don't want to deal with that anymore. I know what it takes to renovate a property because of what I do now. I don't want to deal with that. And I was telling her about, uh, about you before we jumped on the show here and I'm like, Hey, I want to, I want to learn more about the self storage stuff because mm -hmm. you don't want, you know, you don't have to yeah. worry about a tile shower surround. You don't have to worry about clogged toilets. You don't have to worry about a tenant flushing something down the toilet and then clogging up the septic system. Right. It's just, yeah, it's a, it's a roof, it's blocks, it's a door and a lock. And as long as all those are working, you're, you should be okay. Yeah. Let me tell you, talking to somebody who is in, you know, residential commercial construction company, like, I mean, mm -hmm. like you live and breathe this. I, I wish I had your skill set. Like I flipped quite a few houses and done my fix and flip. I just don't particularly like, I'm not, 
I was never a good builder. And like, I just, mm-hmm. I, I admire that skill set. I just don't have it. And so I, I quickly realized fix and flip and construction is not for me, which is why I kind of gravitated yeah. towards wholesaling. That's another reason I like storage is the capital expenditures, what they call CapEx, essentially like yep. the repairs. It's pretty basic. We're talking about metal roofs, concrete yep. block, metal doors, hasp, like locks. Yep. There's not much to it. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty simple and boring business. We rent space. Um, and I that was attractive to me is that like I'm not dealing with all these things that I would have to deal with in the residential world. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I was just thinking as I was writing up these questions and thinking about today's interview, I was thinking about, you know, all the daydreamers watching Home and Garden TV, you know, they're thinking, oh, I want to flip a house. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I, I think, you know, you're telling a story that you, your, your first deal, like it didn't go as well as you hoped, right? No. Way no, back yeah. in the day. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, what, well, my, you're talking about the, the one where I lost a bunch of money. Yeah. Yeah. So 2007, I'll quickly share that story. Uh, people sometimes ask me like, Hey, what's the best deal you've ever done? And, and mind you, and I, and I say this as humbly as possible. Sure. I, and this, by the way, my number is nothing compared to many people I know, but right. I've probably done somewhere between seven and 800 transactions. Okay. Give or take. I, I've never counted. I stopped counting years ago, but somewhere in that range, I've done a lot of deals. My best deal, and I'm, this is not like BS. I genuinely believe this was my best deal. Between mm-hmm. myself and a partner, we lost $102,000. I lost 51 grand in 2007. I decided to get involved in my first fix and flip on a mm. half million dollar property. We bought it for 525. We felt like we could put 70 to 100 into it and that we'd sell for 750 to 800. And then obviously, you know what happened in 2008? The yeah. market completely took a crap. And, uh, and we were lucky to have gotten out only losing that. And fortunately yeah. that didn't like completely put me out of business. But up until that point, Chris, I always viewed coaches, tours, masterminds. I was like, I kind of see the value, but it's an expense. It's not an investment. Like yeah. I, I can figure this out on my own. And man, I did a complete 180 shift. And I'm mm-hmm. like, had I had a coach that was a few steps or many steps ahead of me in the journey, yep. I would have never gotten involved in that deal. And from that point forward to today, yeah. I've never been without a coach. In yeah. fact, today I was, I had a, a meeting with my assistant and we were looking September, October seems to be like the mastermind months. Yeah. I had yeah. three events in a three week period and I'm almost like, I, I might need to like, I can't even go to the, to the, to the one that you and I are in. Oh, really? Right? Oh, that's I'm nice. not even going to be able to make it to that one, which I'm kind of yeah. bummed about. Yeah. But to this day, I have four coaches in wow. different areas. Like that's yeah. a lot. Mm-hmm, you know, and, mm-hmm. and to me, it's like the ultimate insurance policy, you know, that if totally I have agree. a hiccup or a challenge mm-hmm. and I can pick up the phone and lean and get wisdom from people who have been where I haven't been. Yeah. I actually moved to Houston because of my business coach. Really? Yeah. I, I lived in Washington for a couple of years and he goes, Hey, what are you going to do when you sell your property management company? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I guess I'll grow my company in Washington. He goes, I think you'll like Houston. You might want to bring your wife down here and check it out. And we made a decision in April and then in July, we we're down here already. Sold the uh, house. Uh, you're talking of this year? Uh, two years ago. Wow, years ago. man. That, let yeah. me tell you, that, that must, what I gather from that story is A, fortune favors the bold. The fact that you guys yeah. would pick up and, and move states is incredible. B, the impact that that coach must have had and still has on you for you to pick up and move to his city. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that speaks volumes. Yeah. He's, 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 he's a great friend now. So, but yeah, to your point, I highly recommend coaching. Like, don't let Home and Garden TV be your coach. There, mm-hmm. that's that's just for inspiration and like you know daydreaming. But yeah. you know, you need to get in there with people who've done it, made the mistakes already, and so that you don't repeat it. And you won't see Chip and Joanne doing a show on you know self storage. So dig into the self storage thing because flipping a house, wholesaling. There's a lot there and a lot of risk. If you're willing to take it, cool, do it and learn, get a coach. But uh, I'm more interested in the self-storage thing because I, I think it'd be kind of fun yeah, and yeah. Uh, not as scary, I guess, as flipping a house. Even though I have the background that I have, I, I still don't want to do it. Yeah. You know, one thing I'm hoping people get from this show isn't about storage per se, but I, I do want to encourage people that the number one thing that I hear from people that are in the residential space or even Mm -hmm. in a nine to five is that they, they feel intimidated by the bigger numbers, the bigger, you know, the facilities. And I can tell you that in many respects, I find storage 
easier than single family. And what I mean by easier, it's, it's not that it's, it's a get rich quick thing or it's an easy sure. button because you're going to have to put time and energy and effort like anything else. So I want right. to be clear about that, yep. but I don't find nearly as much competition in storage. And there's, there's over 30,000 mom and pop operated storage facilities in oh, the country. Wow. Wow. Uh, a lot more than people think, unlike when I was wholesaling, I, I don't need to do two, three, four storage deals a month. In fact, all I look for is one to two good deals a year. And it's not, you don't need that many to put yourself in a really, really good position. So yeah, that sounds nice. don't be limited by like uh, any limiting beliefs that you have or like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't have money, so I can't get into storage. Man, I've done five deals. And to this day, I have yet to use any of my own capital in these nice. deals. So nice. a lot of the skills we acquire in residential transfer over into storage. Okay. Excellent. Well, sweet. Uh, yeah, you know, we're at about 40 ish minutes. So let's, uh, skip to some of the uh, end questions. Hopefully these would be kind of yeah. quick, maybe, maybe not advice for someone who's wanting to take a leak leap into entrepreneurship, but paralyzed any advice. For people ask like yourself. I think it, it kind of, I have a lot of advice, but I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to keep it short and sweet sure. so we can wind up here, but people are relying on you. Right. And so if I'm not going to be the one to say, Hey, just quit your job and jump into entrepreneurship. Sure. I think that would be reckless in many cases, mm -hmm. but you have to start to construct and build a bridge between where you are today and where you want to go. Yep. So the seeds you plant today is what you're going to reap. And so in the future, right? What you have to manufacture some time, there has to be an exchange of sacrifice in order for what you want in the future. So don't be paralyzed in analysis paralysis mode or like some people talk a big game and they say they want something, but when it comes down to it, they're not really willing to put in the effort. So just be honest with yourself. If you're not willing to put in the effort, then it is what it is yeah. and eliminate the decision fatigue and keep doing what you're doing. But if you're not happy where you're at, ask yourself, how are you going to feel in 12, 24, 36 months when you're in the same position or worse, mm. right? Because we get one crack at this thing called life, like make the most of it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that helps or not, but like, yeah, I, I like think that. people just need to like jump off the mountain and they will build their wings on the way down. I really yeah. believe that. Yeah. What about for the entrepreneur who's work, you know, made that leap? They're working 50 plus hours a week, no end in sight. What's your number one advice for someone like that? G get a clear written vision about what you want your life to look like. So many entrepreneurs focus all of their time, energy, and attention on their business Mm -hmm. Their calendar is jam packed and then they have no time for life. Reverse yeah. the equation, have a written vision about what you want your life to look like without regards to money or possessions. Like what, do you, what is it that fills you up? Like if you could go out, if, if you love hiking, if you love fishing, if you love traveling, like if you love working out, put that on the calendar first mm -hmm. and then go about modifying, building a business that enhances your life's vision, doesn't detract from it. Yeah. And that might sound easier said than done, but if you just take a Saturday afternoon, spend two to three hours with your thoughts, a pen and a paper, and you just say, hey, map out your life. 90% of people are not willing to do that. And yeah. they'll spend more time watching a Netflix show or planning a vacation, plan your life yeah. and then figure out methodically over time, how you can tweak your business, modify it in a mm -hmm. way that enhances and gives you energy that you're seeking. Doesn't like drain you from it. Man. I love that. I love that. Well, sweet, man. So, man, appreciate you being on here. Yeah. I think this conversation could probably go on for another couple hours because I love this <laughs> stuff. Mindset, business, you know, all the crap that we go through as entrepreneurs. But I know that you've got your own podcast and everything. Uh, first of all, if someone wants to get into self-storage, how can they uh, learn more about you, get involved in your community? How, how does that work? Yeah, no, I, I, again, I appreciate that. If you head over to storagewins.com, storage, W-I-N-S, just like it sounds, storagewins.com, uh, there's a, a short, you know, kind of web form there, and then we can schedule a call to, to connect and I can give you more information about storage. In fact, I'll, I'll go ahead and do this, Chris, if it's cool with you, I can yeah. actually give you my, give my mobile number. If you guys text me the word storage, I'll send you over some like free valuable resources, like no strings attached. Um, I've done in-depth presentations about how to find fund and profit from storage. So no crazy funnels or anything like that, man. Just, I'll, I'll just send you the link so you can check out the content. 318-6213. 305-318-6213. Just text me storage. Let me know that you heard me on Chris's podcast and, uh, I'll have my assistant send over some, some valuable resources that can just kind of broaden your horizon a little bit more about storage. Fantastic, man. Appreciate that very much. 
And if anyone wants to learn more about Alex and your story and dig more into who you are and your mindset and your life, like, is there resources behind just your entrepreneur journey? Yeah, man, on, on social media, connecting on Facebook or Instagram, uh, I kind of put my life out there, although I don't, I'm not one of these guys that's constantly posting and sharing yeah. their, but, but yeah, on, on Facebook and Instagram, um, at Alex Pardo 25, you can, you can find me or just alexpardo.com. Okay. Fantastic. Yep. Well, sweet man, again, I appreciate this. I'm bummed you're not going to be at the, uh, the you intensive know, in, in, in Kentucky, but I hope there's an opportunity where we can meet in person and just kind of sure. sit down and have some coffee or whatever, just chit chat about life. It'd, it'd be great. I'd love that. Yeah. So again, appreciate you being on the show and uh, Hey, everyone follow Alex. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. And if you really are into entrepreneurship or self storage or just entrepreneurship itself, his podcast is a great resource, a lot of great guests, a lot of great stories there. You'll get some great inspiration and it'll help you on your journey and, and help you make decisions on what you want to do with your life. So hey, thanks for joining us today. Subscribe, share this with friends and Alex. Thanks again, man. I appreciate you. Thank time. you so much, Chris. Thank you.